Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Travel Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brian Chambers. Hello, all, and welcome to the podcast. I hope you all are safe and healthy, no matter where you are in the world. It's important to stay in touch with friends and family during this difficult time, even if it's only by phone or virtual chat. So if you haven't done so in a while, reach out. I'm sure that it will make their day. Just pick up the phone or go online and do one of those virtual chats just to let them know that you're thinking about them. I think it's really important. So make sure that you guys are staying safe and social distancing. It has made my day for you guys that are tuning in to this podcast here today. We're going to be discussing what to expect when travel returns post-pandemic, recommended domestic travel ideas for 2020, tourist traps that locals hate, And stick around to the end of the show, and I'll be giving you my top five Christmas destinations to take this year in the U.S. Now let's dive right in. It's no surprise people people have travel plans on hold for this upcoming year. People may not be traveling as far right now, but they will be traveling. I know a lot of people are saying, oh, I don't want to travel. They're scared of traveling. But... If you haven't been thinking about somewhere that you'd want to go or want to be, I think you'd be lying to yourself. Everyone has been, you know, in quarantine, and I guarantee people have deciding that I'm going to take that trip later instead of now, or they're getting their wheels are turning and they're thinking about those bucket list trips that they want to take because that's what happens when you have to shift your priorities. When priorities shift, things change, and I truly believe that travel is not going away. So it's only going to change. Yes, it will change, but it's not going away. People are still going to want to travel. And this is going to be something that will alter the way we think about when we choose a destination that we choose to travel to. So what is that going to look like post-pandemic? I mean, there's there's a lot of things that go into this. You know, I know that you're telling yourself... Uh, I don't want to, but the best thing that I think and the most rise, which I think is great, of travel that's happening is domestic travel. People are going, well, I don't want to get on a plane. There's a lot of other ways to travel, so let's do it domestically or staying right here. Plus, with airports and things the way they are, people are are very unsure. So there's a couple reasons that that things are going to change for right now for traveling. So even if you're going to take a trip this year in the pandemic going on, you're going to be sitting there with a couple of things that I want you to keep in mind. If you are trying to travel abroad or by plane, think about wanting to be stuck in another country with all this uncertainty going on. If you travel somewhere and all of a sudden something happens, especially at a time like now in a COVID world, you might get stuck there for who knows how long. You might have to quarantine there. You might They might not have as many flights going out. So that is one thing to keep in mind. And I know it it's, can be scary or some people are like, well, that just means extra vacation. Well, I don't, in my opinion, I don't think that does because there's so much else that when you get stuck somewhere, regardless of whether it has to do with the pandemic, that your brain is thinking about. You're trying to figure other things out. And so getting stuck somewhere is the one thing, in my opinion, that you don't want to have happen to you, especially when you're trying to get home and it's making it difficult. You know, the great reason to explore parts of the country um, 
that you haven't seen is amaze is an amazing thought and I highly encourage it. And people during this post pandemic, you know, once we get out of it, they will have thought of so many different places that they want to go. And they've been putting it off for so long. I, it's always those big trips, right, that you put off. You're like, well, I, I've always wanted to do that. But now that the priorities are shifting, they say, well, let's take let's take the leap. Let's, let's do it before I, I won't be able to travel or do it again. So I think there's going to be a rise after this pandemic or just right after of these larger – trips or the bucket list trips that people have. And that is a wide range. One thing that I want to recommend to everyone with traveling is when we get out of this post pandemic, you're going to be looking at our domestic travel. And I think that's going to be the biggest rise. That's going to be the biggest change that we're going to see after this. And for a few reasons too. One, gas prices being really low at the moment. So just saying that you can get in your car, you know, where, what is it, $2 for a tank of gas, maybe $3 for a tank of gas um, in some parts of the country, maybe even less. Maybe I I think some, where I live, it's just, I think it's close to $2 or something like that for a tank of gas. And you can, you know, fill up in a a 15-gallon tank you know, that will drive you a couple hundred miles, you know, for 30 or $40. And right there, if you can take a family trip, that's number one. So traveling domestically is going to appeal to a lot more people just for the gas prices alone. I mean, that's that saves you so much in money as it is. It's also easier to social distance yourself using your own vehicle. I mean, you can control. That's a setting that you can control. You you're in the household, whoever is living with you, You know, that's safe. You know who's there. And if you don't want to get out or there's a place that you go that there's crowded or there's you don't want to be there, it's easy just to remove yourself from those situations. So taking your own car, being able to control that environment is a great thing. Um, I I also believe that RV rentals, which they have already been shown to be skyrocketing right now, are going to be a a thing, a bigger thing than than we realize. We always... I always attributed like the RV travel and the camping travel to either a a large family or the older generation that retired and say, I don't want to own a house. I just want to get in an RV and drive and live around. But I feel that that is going to be a huge change as we get out of this pandemic. People are going to want to use that means of transportation to see the country a little bit more. And it's a great way because you think about it, there's – uh, an RV class for no matter what style of camper or explorer you are, we'll say, you can do the van, you can do more of like the the bus style, or you can get the really large RV, depending on what you're, you're comfortable driving. You know, they come with, equipped with beds, showers, bathrooms, so you don't even have to use those public bathrooms at like campsites and things like that. You can have your own amenities you know, Wi-Fi, especially with where we're doing a lot more work from home and people are utilizing uh, being at home. So the idea of being able to take an RV, kind of your home and roll it around, allows you to see the world still, travel, get out and away from things, and you still have a, a, a Wi-Fi or internet that you can do all of your work from, which is a, kind of a fantastic idea. So I think that those are going to be on the rise post pandemic and and we're already seeing that but I know things tend to to live in the moment and I feel that as we go forward they're going to continue to rise cuz people are going to find the benefit of those a lot more because economically it makes more sense when you can take a larger family and you're covering hotel cost to go somewhere now certain places you're going to want to go uh, you're going to want to just take your car and stay in the hotel and what amenities and and some people are like that but I really feel that RV if you're considering it It's a great way to look at it, and I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's only going to get uh, busier uh, for rentals. You know, streaming services have actually benefited the most, speaking of Wi-Fi, um, from this pandemic. And with more people at home, they have time to think about what they want to do or where they want to go and what they're going to do once all of this is over. So if we're looking not even at travel but streaming services – I mean, can you answer yourself honestly and say, I never watched a streaming service 
about travel or a trip about travel while I was quarantined. I don't think I think the majority of people will say they watch something having to do with travel. And if not, it's I guarantee it's it's sticking in the back of your head. So you want to make sure that you write those down, you know, put them put them somewhere where you can see them. Right. It, I think it's a fantastic way to, to look at it. Just write it down and throw it up there. You know, booking policies are also going to be changing on both sides. A lot of people think that right now is the best time to get a flight because they they're so desperate to get people back flying. And so flights are cheap. Well, yes, flights, you can find extremely cheap flights. But the reason that you're finding those cheap flights are because no one wants to travel at this time. And if you do, what? is going to be open when you when you go there. Is it really worth the hassle? Which is why I lean more to the get in your own car, take advantage of those gas prices, or look at those RVs, things like that, and get yourself across country. You know, another form of transportation is train. And a lot of people in the U.S. don't really utilize the train as much as they should. I, I feel that using a train can be a lot of fun. I, I've ridden on a train, but I've never done the overnight sleeper car. And I looked into it, and for me, I, I, traveling across country on train actually is more expensive than flying to that destination. I was looking at going from uh, Houston to L.A., and I looked at the prices, and it turns out that Amtrak, on a three-day trip, or, or I guess a two-day trip, with an overnight sleeper car is more expensive than a flight. And it takes, you know, twice the amount of time to get there, or three times, actually. And I sat there wondering why, and I researched a little bit more, but these trains include, if you get those sleeper cars, include your meals. You have access to a shower. You're not confined to sitting down for, you know, four or five hours and not being able to get up. You can go to the dining car. There's... Uh, you know, space to, to move around, you know, it's, it's a really kind of a neat experience. And there's a place where you can just sit and enjoy watching the countryside. It's a wonderful way to see the country. And I would really encourage you to look into it. Now, I know, again, sanitation and all that comes into play, which is why I still lean on taking your own vehicle if you can, and making that trip special. But a train is going to be another another way that we are going to be traveling where you can find a way to isolate yourself that you can't really do on a plane. You know, being able to move around or have your own compartment is going to be a, a bigger deal. So I think that's another thing that will change and we'll see a lot more train travel increase uh, post-pandemic. Now, I talked briefly and mentioned that booking policies are changing on both sides for customers. And that's primarily because people now being aware about needing travel insurance. And that is the most heightened thing that I can tell you is going to be the, the check yes box on almost everyone's travel uh, plans as they as they book coming out of this post pandemic. You know, it's kind of like the insurance for the rental car. You know, am I really going to pay an extra fifty dollars a day for rental insurance? You know, do I really need it? And is it a scam? You know, but having travel insurance going forward, especially right now as we come out of this, is going to be crucial. And that's going to be really, really important. And people are going to be opting for that. The other thing about the travel insurance that I believe that is, is going to really take into effect more is if the flexibility for refund policies um, are, are there. Because that's a strong, that's a huge motivator. Because if someone goes, oh, I can book this trip now. And then, but my refund policy for my for everything and my insurance can come back to me within, you know, two weeks before the trip. And then I don't worry about losing it. You know, that's going to encourage more people to look into booking travel, especially right now. And, and to be honest, I think this trend will go for about a year. It's going to be something really, really huge. And it's a huge motivator for those. I mean, think about it. If you knew that two weeks prior to you could say, oh, nope, or even a week prior to you could get you know, not a 90% refund or even a 100% refund for your trip, people are going to be wanting to book a lot more. And the other thing is, when you book, you have the intention of going. And if there's nothing that completely scares you or happens to you personally, 
I think you're going to see more people take those trips. So with this policy, with the financial incentives, you know, it's going to be it's going to be huge going forward. And I think we're going to see that change. And hotels and uh, travel agents and people that are, are doing these tours, you're going to see a lot of those shift. But make sure you read the fine print on those um, because you, you have to just to, to make sure that what you're getting yourself into is what you're thinking. Because I've done that several times where you, you read enough that you've missed the fine print. So don't let that happen. You know, things ultimately will change with travel, but it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop, guys. Uh, you know, we're just we're natural explorers. We're we're doers. We want to do things. You know, and even if you're not, the ideas of traveling or wanting to get away, even if it's you know taking an hour road trip from your house, I mean, traveling's not going to go away. So I know that we're going to get back into this. You know, many of you guys feel like that bucket list thing has been ailing on you, and you just want to get it, or you're planning one of your next trip during this time. So make sure you keep up with it. Don't let that get away from you. You know, keep that priority of what you want to do coming. And make sure to stick around at the end of the show to hear my top five recommended U.S. vacation trips for this year, for this Christmas season coming up. That's right. I have five recommended U.S. vacations for 2020 just to make sure you get that great Christmas spirit. So don't miss that as we come uh, to the last segment of the show. I want you to stick with me. And first of all, I want to make sure that everyone out there is staying safe, is making sure that you guys are are following, you know, the the guidelines wherever you are, uh, making others safe around you. Uh, you know, we want this to to come to an end because. Who doesn't want to get out and travel? I, I, I'd love to get back to Europe. I'd love to to take that trip. Antarctica is one of my bucket list, you know, and I'm hopefully going to be doing that soon. Um, so stick with us, though, and check out my top five recommended U.S. vacation Christmas trips for this year. That's right. You could be tra- if you haven't started planning something, you could be. you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do. All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back, and thanks for staying with us. We just finished talking about what travel is going to look like or some of the things that we can expect to be dealing with after this pandemic passes. That's right. It's crazy to even say that, the pandemic. I never thought in my lifetime that I would be saying that, but we are, and that is the reality of it. But again, travel is not going to stop. So yes, things will change, but this does not have to discourage you completely. In this segment, I'm going to talk about two trips you can take that are very different, but offer so much, especially at this time. So let's get into it. My first trip that I want to talk about, and this is one that it's pretty accessible to almost everyone domestically in the U.S. that you can get to. It is Memphis, Tennessee. Many people sit there and are like, what? Memphis? Never even thought about going to Memphis. And, you know, there's so much that we don't realize Memphis has in it. It's not one of the major city hubs that or the, you know, doesn't have the coastline for beaches and, you know, crazy, you know, lakes and all all this other stuff. But it is a beautiful city and it has so much to offer. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what you can get into in Memphis, Tennessee, because there's so much to do. You guys don't even realize it. If you want to take a great road trip, this is this is one to do it. Now, you can fly, if you can find a flight 
flights are relatively cheap getting into Memphis. And the the it's really easy really to get into the to the Memphis uh, airport. But if you decide to drive, I recommend doing a trip up through what they call the Blues Road, the Musicians Road, which is an old highway through Mississippi or going up that way if you're coming from the south where all the old musicians used to drive through gigs. They used to go back and forth between New Orleans and Memphis and other places, and they used to drive that road just to get to gigs. And so they kind of, they call it the Musicians of the Blues Road. So Memphis, if you guys don't know, is home to Sun Studios. And if you don't know what Sun Studios is, that is where Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis Presley, and Carl Perkins had the infamous million dollar, that's the million dollar quartet recorded. They were all part of of Sun Studios, signed by Sam Phillips, and that was in Memphis, Tennessee. And at one point, they were all in the, the that exact studio, and you can go in. And it's a live studio. It's still a working studio today. And they have the microphone that Elvis actually held. You can actually hold the microphone that he held. And there's a, an X on the floor when you go into the studio and if you do the tour that they show you this is where Elvis stood. So that is – it's really kind of cool. Um, and then if you look at one of the pianos that's in the studio, there's a big – burn mark on one of the the bass keys on the piano it's like a cigar ring on there and i asked the the guide when i was checking out the studio i said well why why did you guys keep this piano with this big burn mark and he goes oh well jerry lee lewis played that and he put a cigar out on the piano and i said well do they know why he did that was he angry or something and they said no he did it because he could and and ultimately, he was that good of a musician and that cocky that he could do that. And it's, so they keep it today, and it's kind of a cool reminder. So if you're really big into music, this is a must-see stop that you're going to want to check out. I had so much fun. I was kind of like a kid in the candy shop. And my wife took me on this trip. This is a big music trip. So if you're really into music and history, Memphis is going to be a great spot for you. Because not only can you check out Sun Studios, but you can check out the Stax Museum. Um, which pays homage to the artists who created the sounds that continue to influence current artists today. You know, continuing, continuing into 2020 is Run This Town exhibit, which tells the story of a dozen Memphian women, I think I said that right, Memphian women, including Estelle Axton, who co-founded Legendary Stax Records. Okay, so the Stax Museum will show you so much history among that. And, you know, Stax Record is home to Otis Redding, you know, and Sam and Dave. I mean, there, there's just so many amazing artists that have come out of that city. It's unreal. And these are two museums and, and studios that you can check out that will just give you just a glimpse into history of music today. And you're going to see how relevant it is. And it's really kind of neat. So if you are, if music is not your thing, which it's hard to, it's hard to not get into the the feel of the music in Memphis, you know, and you want to check out some great restaurants. They Memphis is known for some fantastic restaurants. They have James Beard nominated restaurants. Uh I believe from back in last year in 2019, uh they had several restaurants that were nominated. And one of them that I found which I didn't get a chance to try, but I had a friend who tried it and said it was phenomenal. Andrew Michael Italian Kitchen. It's infused Italian cooking with southern with a southern style. Which, first of all, man, I love Italian. But being being from the South, anytime you can get that southern style in there, oh, my mouth is my mouth is, is watering, guys. I can't even tell you how hungry I am, and I just ate. So if you love Italian and you want to get a little flair of some Southern style with it, I recommend, highly recommend this place. The other one is the Four Way. And the Four Way is soul food at its finest. I mean, you're not gonna, you're going to find everything on that menu just so delicious. And the really neat thing about this place, not only does it have history of being there for so long, but it's where Dr. Martin Luther King and Elvis ate. So it, it's a really neat to say that you ate where Dr. King ate. You're you're supporting uh, Memphis, you know, local business. Um, 
you know, and and if if you're not if you're not an Elvis fan, that's okay. The food will make up for it, I promise. So there's so many options to to check out. So we we ended up uh, when we got there the first time, it was closed because we just didn't check, you know, scheduling and things like that, and what day they were open. But it is well worth going back for. I, my, I man, like I said, I'm, I'm my mouth is watering. For all you history buffs out there, again, I was talking about Memphis being so packed with history. Well, <laughs> the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel is in Memphis, Tennessee. That's right. This is a brilliant, brilliant museum that I think everyone should check out. Um, the history that goes that you just read about and gets really put to the forefront and in your eyes um, of our civil rights and all the movements that have happened through the U.S. Memphis is is a big hub for for all of these, and not even not even mentioning the fact that the Lorraine Motel is where Dr. Martin Luther King was shot, and they actually have when you walk up, they have the room. It's it's you can't go in, but they have like the window and like this plexiglass, and everything is as is. So it's the same time period. They haven't changed anything. They left the room as it is. And it's just kind of just a monument to him. And and they have music that's playing. And um, it was gospel music that was playing when I walked up. And it it just touched your heart and and made you made you feel, you know. I mean, I'm I hope I don't tear up, guys, because it's just a very moving experience to go visit that and to pay tribute uh, to what that beautiful man stood for. So I, you know, if you get a chance, it's right across the street from the National Civil Rights Museum. So you can kind of do one and the other or do them both, you know, back to back. And it's something that I think everyone should do. And I never even realized that was in Memphis when I got there the first time, when I learned about that, when I was going, I was like, oh, that's there. And so it's well worth getting to check that out. Um, and of course, you can't go to Memphis without going to Graceland. Okay, so Graceland is outside of of Memphis, the city itself, but it's we're talking maybe about a a ten minute, maybe fifteen minute drive from from like downtown Memphis. And if you've never been to Graceland, <laughs> it is worth going to at least once. I, it's really neat. I'm a I'm a big Elvis fan, not an obsessive Elvis fan. Let me tell you that, but I'm a big Elvis fan, I and mean, he influenced so much. Um, and it is a really neat, really neat house to go check out, but it's not what you would think. I mean, it's, it's not like in the middle of, uh, of like a real busy area. It's, it's, it's still in the the neighborhood. And so you drive out there and you have to get a bus to go across to the house itself. And they, there's only certain parts of the house you can go through, but the rooms are still as they were in the time period, which is really kind of neat. And you have to kind of stay on this this one path. Um, but it's it's a really cool experience just to say you've gone. But let me tell you guys, you only need to go once. Unless you are an Elvis fanatic, there's no reason to go back for me. So I appreciate it. I love it. It's it's a ton of fun. There you can see all the cars and his all his toys that he had go into the the recording studios it also does shine a light on how big elvis really was when you're there i mean we all know that i mean we call him the king for a reason but we know how big he was but it shines an even brighter light and you just go wow man his accomplishments fantastic so but check it out it's well it's worth doing at least once while you're there and it's not too far out of the way um you can do it it doesn't have to be like a full day trip so if you go in the morning you can you know make it back by you know early afternoon and still have time in your day um, so those are just a couple of things. You can't go to Memphis without going to Beale Street as well. So make sure you check out Beale Street. You know, there's so many different clubs where you can check out some live music. Uh, you know, Beale Street is Beale Street, you know, but you're going to find a couple of great spots if you go off the beaten path a little bit. But it never hurts to venture down, especially if you've never been. It's always great to kind of say, I've been to Beale Street. You know, other spots to check out. If you're really into music, you might want to check out the Gibson Guitar Factory downtown, which is a lot of fun. 
and the Peabody Ducks. You can go check out these ducks. They're kind of celebrities, and they live on the, the hotel's rooftop. And, like, every day they march. They have, like, a big ceremony, the grand, where they come to the grand lobby, and they march these ducks down this little carpet into the fountain. And the tradition dates back to 1933 when the general manager returned from a hunting trip and placed several live duck decoys in the hotel's fountain. And it attracted these other ducks, and they just stayed. So they've become like part of the hotel. So that's something that you can actually see. And it's a big ceremony. It's a, it's a really big deal. But there's so many things to do. Memphis, definitely a place you can get to if you can find a cheap flight, but easy to drive to. And it's always good to have your own car. So check that out. Another trip that I'm going to suggest is Napa Valley. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, gosh, man. California, really, Napa is very well known. I was like, yes, it is well known. And if you don't like wine, people are just like, why would I go to Napa? And I say this, I challenge you to go to Napa, even if you don't like wine, because it'll give you more of an appreciation than you thought you had. And there's so many fantastic places to really to get that. It's, it's not all, oh, I have wine, I'm a snob. You know, it, it's not like that. Everyone is down to earth. They are doing and love what they do, and they really are wanting you to experience it. And it never hurts to learn, guys. I mean, it's I was never a wine person. My wife actually got We took this trip because uh, it was one of the places she really wanted to go. And it was phenomenal. I, I want to go back. And I'm not even a huge wine person. I have more of an appreciation for wine. Because I also know what I like, which is which is kind of a big deal. I also kind of realize everything at home when I was drinking wine is honestly kind of like crap wine, apparently. Because after I came back and was drinking some of the stuff I had at home, I was like, oh, this is not as good. Why? <laughs> and, you know, my wife's like, oh, your palate is refining. But I think it's, yes, I, that's true. But I still think that it's more, I found more tastes and things that I really love and grapes that I like. So... Napa is a wonderful place to go. It's also great if you have a group. You know, if you can get there by car, it's it's always good to have your own car there, to be honest. But they do have Uber and Lyft that you can get around in the valley. But, you know, flying into San Francisco or the Oakland airport is going to be the way to go if you are willing to fly. And then renting a car because it's that way it's only about an hour and 20 minute drive from San Francisco, which is a really beautiful drive, too. You can cross the Golden Gate. Uh, you know, you can see the Redwoods and travel up through the... And it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful drive. So I highly recommend getting into San Francisco or even Oakland and taking a car and making that drive. It, it's just a wonderful scenic route. So, but once you get into the valley, you know, it's it's just, you understand why people want to go so much. I mean, Napa you can go to almost at any time you can visit Napa. Christmas time is one of those times I wouldn't recommend and most people wouldn't. Uh it's when a lot of the vineyards take a little bit of time off that you know, they're working so so much that they have to get downtime, you know, cuz harvest season is between August and October. And so that's like a really big season and so after harvest and all that goes down, you know, and Christmas kind of comes around. It's kind of their downtime. And then, of course, in the spring when, you know, things are getting planted again and coming up. And that's one thing they don't tell you. Everyone says they want to go to Napa if they're big wine people during harvest. But the thing about harvest is, all yes, all the grapes are on the vines. But you also, there's dirt all on the ground because, you know, they, they're ready to, to be picking. We went during March. Weather was absolutely gorgeous. And the ground, I was expecting to be dirt as well, but it was green because they let the weeds grow in to help, you know, with the soil and everything. So it was really beautiful, actually, and it was just not what I was expecting. And even going in March, there were so many vineyards that were open. Um, we got a chance to try some fantastic wines. Um, it, it was just it was just wonderful. I, I really loved it. I really loved it. Now, realize when you do go to travel to places in the valley, you have to make reservations. Um, that is recommended, and I am going to stick by that. If you're going during down season, so it's sometime in the spring, um, if you can stand the summer weather, God bless you. But 
you're going to want to make reservations, but if you're in the down season, you there's a lot of places you can show up and just say you want to do the tasting, and if they don't have anyone or there's open spots, they'll give it to you. So that's uh, something to, to keep in mind. So you're going to want to do a little bit of research, you know, because the valley's divided into little towns, a little stretch of towns along the road. Uh, you have Napa, Yauntville, St. Helena, and Calistoga. And it takes probably about 15 to 20 minutes to drive across the entire highway, uh, the road, the strip. So it's you can check all of them out. But you're always going to want to have a, a designated driver or, again, use Uber or Lyft um, when you do that because those add up. So you want to pace yourself throughout the day. But weather being beautiful, just that relaxing feeling of just being able to experience that. You also want to check this out at least once, the mud baths. That's right, mud baths, and you will not appreciate it until you do it. You know, my body, as I get older, I am really enjoying skin products and taking care of it, and the more I travel, the more I get introduced to some of these fantastic ways to take care of my body or to really splurge, you know. It's kind of like those spa spa days, and, and I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to lie, guys. If I can get a good spa day in, absolutely, man. I'm going to do it. If you don't find me in the water, on the beach somewhere, I, I'm going to see if I can get at least a massage somewhere. Uh, but a mud bath is kind of just a, a really neat experience. It's messy, but it's really neat. So don't don't shy away from that. I'm going to just throw out one recommended winery. Um, now, let's say, do your research. There's so many to choose from. But one that we visited, and it happened to be the very first one, had a lovely experience. It's called Eller's. Uh, which is not only a beautiful property, great wine, but it's been around since the early 1800s. But in 1996, um, it was, uh, I would say, make sure I say her name right, Jean and Slovain established the Leduc Foundation. It's an international grant making the organization, helping the organization to support research in cardiovascular disease and stroke. So not only when you get this great experience and beautiful wine and a gorgeous property. But when you purchase a bottle or you're there, even doing a tasting, you're helping support cardiovascular research. Uh, and that's a big deal, especially since, you know, my grandfather passed, um, you know, due to uh, heart failure and, and my wife's dad did the same. So it, it touched us. And so I, I really recommend that you're going to get a, a really lovely Lovely experience with that. And, and like I said, lodging over there is, is really neat. Most most of the places are more like a bed and breakfast style that you're going to get. Uh, but there are some some resorts. Uh, I personally love the bed and breakfast style and things like that. And before all you foodies out there, let me just tell you, the food, phenomenal. Everywhere you go, you, the food's going to be great. You know, the mustard grill, Bottega, all those places – Highly recommended. The one place we didn't get into, and if you're interested, it's very, very high end, is called the French Laundry. It's in Yauntville, but you have to have, I think it's a minimum of six months in advance for reservations. That's how busy this, that place is. But if it's anything like the food that we ate at all the other places, man, it will be worth the wait. So like I said, Napa, great, great relaxing experience for either a romantic getaway or a group. So check it out. And make sure that you do a little bit of research before you go, and you're going to have just – I can guarantee you're going to have a wonderful time. So stick with us because when we come back, we're going to talk about those tourist traps that locals hate. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast. Podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back, guys. We were just talking about some fantastic trips that you could take coming up this year. And recommended was Memphis, Tennessee, music lovers and history buffs, and just good home southern food. Man, you're gonna you're not gonna want to miss that. Also, for those that want a little bit more of a refined palate, you know, Napa Valley. Um, even if you don't, great getaway, uh, gorgeous weather, some sunshine. You know, great for groups or romance if you want to get your significant other on a way on a trip. You know, get a bottle of wine, hang out, have some food, and just relax. Because sometimes that's all we need. You know, traveling vacations and just traveling in general doesn't have to be stressful. You know, hopefully when you do travel, it's enjoyable. I mean, that's why we want to travel. If we didn't enjoy it, why would we keep doing it? So, you know, anytime if you're a a go-doer, you know, or just someone that likes to relax – You know, look at either of these trips because there's something in it for both of you. So you can't go wrong with either one. In this segment, we're going to move into talking about a few tourist traps. That's right, the tourist traps that locals can't stand. And for those of you that live in a major city and have one of those attractions... You know, think about how often someone comes to visit you and they say, I've got to go do this. And are you rolling your eyes or are you saying anything? You know, (laughs) so there are those in in every city that there's something that someone's like, oh, great, they're going to do this. Or it just becomes really annoying because it's just tourists that are clogging up areas in, in the in your city that you're just like, I've got to get to work. Can you guys move? So there are a couple traps. Some of them you might not agree with. I'm going to share a couple. There's there's a lot that you could find out there. But I'm, I just came up with a few that I feel are the are bigger tourist traps. And some you may not even realize. So like many travelers love getting that authentic experience. And but when I tell this, when I say these traps, by no means am I saying you shouldn't go to these places. But don't expect locals to be thrilled you're there. You may not agree with this, but hey, it's only my opinion. All right, so let's start off with the biggest one. Times Square. Yes, Times Square. (laughs) When you think of New York, most people think of Statue of Liberty, Times Square, Central Park, and Empire State Building. I think those are probably the first few things. Personally, to me, Broadway is the first thing that pops into my head. But, and Broadway being really close right there at Times Square, you know, it's there. It's the only reason you'd find me there, to be honest. So if you ask anyone who's been to New York, it's a, it's a must-do for those that don't live there. <laughs> and it is crazy the amount of people that travel to New York. So if you are wanting that authentic experience and not wanting to have, you know, vendors or street vendors coming up to you and people, you know, knowing that you're a tourist, you're going to want to avoid Times Square because you're not going to find a lot of locals there unless they have to go there for work. Uh, My family would never recommend going to Times Square. I have family in New York and they, you wouldn't catch any of them there. And according to locals, it's the worst tourist trap in the entire city. Every year, no matter the season, New York attracts millions and millions of tourists from around the world. It's estimated more than three, I think it said 380,000 people that walk through uh, Times Square every day, according to Times Square monthly pedestrian count reports. That's a lot of people going through Times Square a day. Almost 400,000 people a day are going through Times Square. So if you've never been there, it's neat. Go check it out. But you're going to get there and be like, that's it? It's just really busy. You know, unless you're going to a Broadway show or something like that, I'm going to recommend checking out other areas in New York because New York has so much to offer. Um, But if you have to make it a must do, you can. But don't again, don't expect tourists or don't expect locals to be telling you how to get there or don't be surprised if they tell you in a very salty manner. The second one I'm going to share that's a tourist trap, and many of you might not even think of this. We're going to travel over to Chicago, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois. The Cloud Gate, or as people call it, the Bean. Um, that's 
kind of what it's more fondly known as. But the bean is a tourist trap. And guys, yes, I've been there, and it is just packed with people. Packed with people. It's it's a sculpture in the middle of the city. I mean, there's nothing to do except take pictures of yourself reflecting off of you and the city. Now, it's it's got some really neat architectural features to it. In fact, it was created by a public sculptor, uh, artist Sir Anish Kapoor. Um, and it was supposed to distort the city skyline with its unique architectural design. I mean, that was kind of the purpose for it. So to sit in the middle of the city, just to to give that distorted look to the city and just this new, really neat look. And it is it is very interesting and, and neat. And it's kind of cool to go. But, you know, it's it's a sculpture, guys. And it's right there in Millennial Park and one of the busier areas in Chicago. If you're if you're in Chicago and you don't live there. And again, you're not going to find many, many locals that are hanging out there. It's going to be all tourists and it's trying to get that perfect selfie or, you know, and you're never going to get that, that best selfie. There's so many people there, you know, unless you're getting like a super close up of you with the reflection, you're not going to get it. And trust me, we went, we tried to do this, you know, when we researched the, you know, it's on all the, if you're going to Chicago, go check out the bean, you know, we did it. If it's, if it's really important to you, check it out. I personally don't think that it was worth going over there. It was one of those things that we, sure, we were happy we did it, but honestly, I wouldn't have missed that. So that is one thing that, there's so many other places in Chicago that I, I would tell you to go check out that would not be one of them, even though I know it's high on many people's lists when they go to the city. But guys, it's just a statue. Okay, the next one this is where a lot of people might disagree with me, but I'm going to say this anyway. Las Vegas Strip. The Las Vegas Strip, guys. That's right. I said it. I said it. The Las Vegas Strip. I know it's hard to avoid this one, uh, but for me, I love when I got off the Strip. When I was in Vegas and I got a chance to get off the Vegas Strip, it was a breath of fresh air. You know, I do love going to the shows, and being part of some of the nightlife, I, I'm not a crazy, I, I don't do the crazy nightlife stuff. Um, but I will say I got, my wife and I stayed up late in the club to watch Little John uh, spin. And, you know, that was late for us because he, he didn't even go on, like he didn't even come on till like 1 a.m. or something like that, maybe even 2. So, I mean, if you're if you're really into that nightlife, which I know some people are really into that and love that, it's awesome. There's there's lots going on. And, and I get it. It's really hard to avoid the strip when you go to Vegas, especially when you're from out of town. But if you can check out shows or things that, you know, there's a lot of outdoor stuff. If you're an outdoor person, you know, um, go out to the canyons, uh, check out the Hoover Dam. I mean, there's so many other things in Vegas to check out than the strip. So I, I recommend doing those. Um, but the Vegas Strip is, is a huge tourist trap. I mean, you're gonna find, you're gonna find. It's great for people watching, but you got to be careful. It's so crowded, especially around the Bellagio fountains. I mean, everyone's trying to get that picture, check out the fountains. If you've never seen them, yeah, they're they're really neat. But man, you are gonna get packed in to watch those fountains for, and you may not even get a, a great view. And it's you know a five minute little deal, and it's just. I don't know. I, I I agree with the tourists on this one. If you lived in Vegas, local or sorry, I agree with the locals on this one. If you live in Vegas, the locals want to avoid the strip, you know. And once you've been in a casino, you've been in. It feels like you've been in any of the casinos because they all have things that are unique. But it's a casino; they're pretty much the same. So if you're into the gambling. I know a lot of people are. That's great. You know, check it out. I personally like to kind of avoid that. I'll, I'll play a little blackjack just to say I played some blackjack. But I, I really go for the shows and kind of do stuff outside the strip. And, you know, the last two times I've gone, um, the final trip, I was just really tired of the people. 
um, the crowds and things like that on the strip. So if, if that's kind of you and you want to avoid that, Las Vegas is not for you. It can be a, a really fun city, and there's just more to do than you realize. But maybe you might not agree with that. But I'm going to say the, the Vegas Strip. It can be a big tourist trap. Okay, the next one. And this one I feel even more adamant about, Lombard Street in San Francisco, California. Tourist trap. Guys, it's a street. It's a really windy, curvy street. Should I say that again? It's a street. <laughs> I mean, that's it's got some really cool views of San Francisco. The only reason we ended up driving down Lombard Street was because we got lost in the city. <laughs> we were driving around and we happened to get lost and came across Lombard Street and we ended up driving down it. And let me tell you, first of all, driving down it is not any fun. It you have to it, it is so steep. You have to go so slow going around and when you're coming up, you can't even see like what's in front of you going down. <laughs> and it's like it's like a roller coaster in slow motion right and on top of that going down there's so many people that are just hanging out taking pictures on the street i mean locals have got to hate that because it's a residential area i mean people that live around the area they they can't even get around because people are just stopping to take pictures of of this winding street and let me tell you san francisco is full of hills and winding streets maybe not quite as unique as lombard street but still, guys, it's a street. It's a street. I mean, I personally would rather go check out Alcatraz, you know, than drive down Lombard Street. So if you're going to be there and it's a must-do for you, man, I'm I'm telling you that I don't think it's worth that your time getting, getting over there. Plus, you're just clogging up traffic. You're not going to make the locals very happy with that one. Okay, the next one. Again, another one that everyone might not love or many of you might disagree with me on or tell me that I'm crazy for saying this is Bourbon Street being a tourist trap. Bourbon Street. I mean, New Orleans is a fabulous city, great food, wonderful nightlife. You know, every time I go, I eat so well and I have a good time. But Bourbon Street, again, guys, it's a one and done. It's it's it's. You get there, every you know, drinks and places. It's it's crowded. Everything's overpriced. You're you're not really getting an authentic. If you're wanting that uh, Louisiana authentic experience, you're not really going to get that uh, on Bourbon Street. You know, very commercialized. You know, if you want to party, you know, or or you're into drinking and and things like that and experiencing the nightlife in New Orleans. There's a lot of places that you can do that that aren't on Bourbon Street and aren't going to charge you an arm and a leg for for cocktails, you know. Plus, on top of all the crowds, you have bachelorette party after bachelorette party just going crazy. And I don't know about you guys, but when I go on vacation or I'm traveling and I want to experience a city, I don't want to have to deal with crazy bachelorette parties, you know, um, and just craziness going on, you know, and that's going to be on Bourbon Street. A lot of people, they have to go to Bourbon Street, and it's just, it it makes it for a not a very fun experience, in my opinion. I mean, when you have that many people and you're just kind of like packed in, it's kind of the reason that if I was going to go back down to New Orleans or, or go for Mardi Gras, I would want to get, uh, find a place where you can be that had like a balcony or somewhere or, or go experience Mardi Gras because it's a wonderful tradition. But experience it without being on Bourbon Street just because, you know, like being in Times Square for New Year's, like just being jam packed in, you know, there's it just to me, it's it's not a fun experience. And as a traveler, you know, I don't enjoy that as much. Some of you may be into that, but I'm going to tell you it is overhyped, guys. Walk there, say you did it, go to Pat O'Brien's, enjoy it, you know, have a cocktail, then leave. But it is not a must do on my list, and I think it's a trap that that they overhype. And locals will probably agree with you. If you want some really good jazz, you know, check out Frenchman Street. That has some phenomenal musicians uh, for jazz, and that's on a, um, a little bit farther um, 
from Bourbon Street off the beaten path, but it is well, well worth it. Well, stay with me because you won't want to miss my top five recommended U.S. holiday destinations for this upcoming year. Always on the go, but the day just won't be one without your Hollywood fix. Let Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast take care of that. Jordan and Keith is Entertainment Tonight meets Access Hollywood. I'm Jordan. Guy laughing, that's Keith. (laughs) Yeah, I'm Keith. An all-inclusive look of pop culture. Welcome back. We were just discussing the tourist traps that locals can't stand. But now it's time to move on to something a little more exciting. As promised, I'm going to reveal my top five recommended U.S. Christmas destinations for this upcoming year. So if you, like me, love everything Christmas then get ready to start planning that holiday getaway for this 2020 season. That's right. We talked about earlier in the show, you know, what's it going to be like traveling? You know, Christmas, man, I think is going to be crazy. So if you, people are going to want to get away, and I think that's going to be enough time where they felt has passed, where they feel more comfortable to travel. So if you are one of those people that are considering it, and I'm one of those people, you need to start looking at at planning those Christmas vacations now. And I have a couple recommendations for you. And these are my top five. And you are going to want to do a little extra research on your own, but I'm going to give you more than enough reason why you want to pick one of these top five. Number one, and this should come at no no shock. Number one, North Pole, Alaska. I mean, if you're going to do Christmas right, do it at the North Pole, right? I mean, it's in the name, the North Pole. I mean, you can't get more Christmas than that by going to a place called the North Pole, right? So this is – the North Pole was given its holiday theme name by a development company selling property and hoping to attract a toy manufacturer that advertised products as being made in the North Pole. So the, the name stuck even though the factory – the toy factory never uh, materialized and didn't didn't come to fruition. But – it's stuck, and so now North Pole, Alaska is only about a 15-minute drive from Fairbanks. So if you go into Fairbanks, which is a major city in Alaska, you can get over there pretty easily. And if you're going to Alaska at Christmas time, you're going to want to go to the North Pole. I mean, it's like going somewhere and saying, if you want to go somewhere to say you've been, yeah, check it out. Not only is it called the North Pole and it is Christmas all over the place, There's so much to do, okay? They have an ice contest, which attracts ice sculptors from around the world. And if you have never seen a sculpt, an ice sculpture done, it's amazing. The artistry of it and what they can do is unreal. And they're just, they're beautiful. And it's kind of a a really magical thing to kind of see. Um, Especially if you have uh, kiddos and are traveling with family members or people that are are very artistic like that. They love this kind of stuff. I do. I personally love it. Um, and these sculptors are from around the world. So worth checking out. The, the winter festival draws crowds with lots of activities and fireworks. Okay. And during this time of year, it's not unusual for national TV broadcast to happen. Uh, from Santa Claus's house. I mean, that isn't, and you can't, can you blame anyone that? That's got to be a request in my in my thoughts, you know, that to have Santa's house nationally broadcast. So if you see at Christmas time a broadcast on TV and it says North Pole, Alaska, you know, North Pole, it might be North Pole, Alaska. So it's kind of a neat thing. And also at the North Pole post office there, uh, which is, I should say, located on uh, it's south on Santa Claus Lane. That's right. Um, of course. <laughs> I mean, where is it not located? It's got to be on Santa Claus Lane. So the North, po- the North Pole Post Office is another thing to, that is kind of neat, which they receive, 
I think it was said that they received like 4,000 letters, you know, every week or something like that um, for kids writing, which is kind of neat. Uh, but again, if you're just really big into that Christmas and wanting to get kind of thrust into the Santa Claus and the spirit of it, this is a wonderful destination. Um, there's other things to do, like, you know, you fishing, hiking, outdoor things, you know. I mean, you're in Alaska, so there's there's lots to do. There's good restaurants, um, and, and it's just kind of a fun family getaway, especially if you love the snow, too. Realize, guys, Alaska, lots of snow. So if you're one of those people in the, in the south or like my wife who, who can't stand it getting below 75 degrees, you may want to rethink that. But it does make for kind of a magical experience. It's just a fun way to spend the holidays um, as if you feel as if you're in Santa's backyard. Okay, number two. Number two, Mackinac Island, Michigan. Now, this one, if you are, we talked about kind of being in Santa's backyard with uh, North Pole, Alaska, but Mackinac Island up in Michigan, the northern part of Michigan, you actually have to take a ferry to get there. So it it does take a little bit more work to get to this destination, but man, is it worth, man, is it worth it? You just feel like you're back in time. Uh, you just traveled back in time into just a different experience. And so if you're kind of looking for that taken out of all this craziness of modern Christmas and things like that and technology and all this, you know, Mackinac Island is a great place uh, for romance, a romantic Christmas, a family Christmas, or just wanting to get away. It's it's beautiful. Not only is the scene, the scene, the scenery gorgeous, you know, the peak season, this is where it's, it's kind of cool. The peak season for travelers ends in October just because the weather gets really, really cold. So you're actually not, if you're going at Christmas, you're actually not even going at peak season. So that's kind of neat because a lot of places like this tend to have prices jump when you get into peak season. You know, now all ho- hotels and things up there are subject to change. And, you know, so always check things out before you go. Um, but you're bound to find some really great deals if you're willing to make the extra trip um, a little farther north in Michigan. I mean, Mackinac Island, the winter festival is the big thing there. You know, you have sledding, uh, snow golf, which I've never done, but man, I would totally check out. Broom hockey, which is a ton of fun uh, for anyone. And if you want to really feel like you're uncoordinated, <laughs> like me sometimes, broom hockey is just, you're just going to have, you're going to be laughing the whole time, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, that bonfire cookouts, cross country skiing, sleigh rides. I mean, if you really wanted to take on authentic sleigh ride, uh, this is a beautiful location to do it. It is like stepping into a holiday movie. I mean, it's really like stepping into a holiday movie. So you can have something for everyone, but Mackinac Island, definitely a destination you want to check out. Highly recommend it. Number three, number three, Asheville, North Carolina. So this is one that I hope to get to do this year. You know, North Carolina has some beautiful landscapes and makes a perfect setting for, you know, the I mean, it's just a perfect setting for the town of Asheville at Christmas time. It really is. Uh, A sure thing, um, make sure you guys check out, is the Biltmore. I mean, the biggest event of the holiday season. You know, America's largest home, teched out in in holiday goodness. I mean, if you've ever wanted to go to the Biltmore, just think of now going to the Biltmore on steroids. It's got all the holiday decorations. It's the lights, just the atmosphere. One that's you've one that I'm going to say you've got to do especially if you're into that holiday spirit. You know, also the fact is Asheville is known for its local breweries. So after you're done sledding uh with your family, you know, sneak away downtown and warm up with some craft brews. I mean, cuz they're known for a lot of that, you know. Or, you know, bring the family along, you know. I don't know. You do you, right? So <laughs> it's it, there's a lot of fun to it. There's plenty of restaurants, so you're not going to ever run out of choices there, you know, no matter what your your preference is. And one of the really neat things, if you need if you're in the mood for more of a family fun or just wanting to let that inner kid 
in you out, you can get on the Polar Express train. That's right, guys. I said you could get on the Polar Express train at the Great Smoky Mountains Railroad uh, to pick up Santa. So um, you can have that whole experience. So if your kiddos, you know, if you've ever, or personally you, you know, I read that book when I was probably in first grade or something like that, when I was really young, six or seven. You read that book and you just want to kind of get that feeling for it. This is a wonderful way to literally do that. You get to ride the trains through the mountains. It's it's like the book coming to life and you're going to pick up Santa. I mean, it, it's great. So besides that, you know, if you, there's plenty of outdoor activities. You know, if you stay in one of the uh, fancier hotels, they'll, they'll have hot tubs, things like that if you're one of those. Um uh, you know, shops, you're not going to run out of shops. There's plenty of great boutique shops. And, and like we talked about, some of the wonderful restaurants, you know, and lights are hard pressed. I mean, it, it's it's really hard pressed to be a Grinch on that trip. So I, I dare you to try to be a Grinch on that trip. Your heart's going to grow 10 times. All right. Number four, number four, this one I'm super excited for. And I've been waiting all show to get to this one. Well, my last two, really. But number four, Durango, Colorado. Durango, one of the greatest little towns I've ever been to in Colorado. It really is. Uh, I was visiting a friend in Farmington, New Mexico, and we took a day trip there. Before we even got to town, we stopped at this little like local honey shop, uh, and they actually made their own honey. And they they showed us how, how they did it, and that, you know— they showed us where the bees were, and they had this kind of this setup to where you could, without having to get into a, a suit, you know, could could witness what was happening. And they had this tube that came from the inside with one of their their hives that was actually in the store, but it wasn't open to the store. But it was it was covered, but like a tube that went to the outside, and so bees could get in there. And they had one of the, the slides that was up, so you could actually see what was going on. And then you could just they would let you sample all this honey. And it was, oh, so delicious. And it was a really cool experience. And so that was even before we got into downtown Durango, that was one of the things we got to do. So right away, I was already flying high on that trip. Um, so I highly recommend that if you if you get a chance uh, to check out little boutique shops like that. They're so neat. It is a very neat experience. Very cold because you are dealing with the Rockies there. Um, but the town it felt like a small ski town that hadn't been discovered it really it durango is it's not like steamboat or vale it, yes it gets busy but it it feels a little bit for a traveler not too overwhelming you know especially if you're looking for that really down to earth type of ski town this is a really great one for you and it, it's hard not to love it when you get there. I mean, the scenery alone with the mountains in the background is beautiful. So, you know, I know going back is an option for me, and I plan on doing that. It, if you decide to make this your holiday destination and you want to avoid crowded places, check out Durango, Colorado, all right? So, I mean, have you ever... I have to ask you guys this. Have you ever wanted to have that Griswold family Christmas, you know, where they, if you've never seen, you know, the Griswold family Christmas, Christmas vacation, uh, where he goes out and he wants to like cut down his own tree, right? Well, you can actually do that when you go to Durango. Don't worry, don't worry. It actually helps reduce wildfire, okay, uh, for the upcoming year. It helps reduce the wildfire danger for the upcoming year. So it is... It is safe, and they you don't even have to bring your own axe or chainsaw or anything like that. But if, you, if you've ever wanted to have that, you know, instead of going to the lot and saying, I'll take this one and having to haggle with the guy, if you want to just go find your own tree and cut it down, you can do that, uh, which is a really cool thing. And I, I want to do it so bad. I mean, I, I'm going back just for that experience, guys. <laughs> um, you board the Cascade Canyon train. Um, with uh, with the Durango and Silverton uh, narrow gauge railroad, so that's where you you board uh, for the experience. And there's no need to bring tools, like I said. They provide the saws and anything that you need, and you get to bring it back on the same train, so that the tree is hauled back to Durango on the steam train. 
So you cut it down and then you haul it back. It's, so it's kind of it's kind of a really neat. So you don't have to trek through, you know, fifteen miles of snow to find the perfect one. They they bring you out there and they bring you back. So it's really neat. But you get to really do really pick and personalize your own Christmas tree, which is is really great because I think it's a it's a big thing for someone to personalize their Christmas tree. You know, and of course there are plenty. There's plenty of shopping and restaurants to choose from, uh, with the added bonus of fantastic winter skiing, right? So not only is that, you got fantastic Colorado skiing. So start looking into it now. Seriously, guys, I'm already planning my Christmas trip. Now that I'm going through my list, I, I'm having trouble now narrowing it down. I thought I knew exactly what I was planning, but I I don't know. Asheville, maybe I got to go back to Durango. I, I don't know. But Durango, Colorado, definitely my number four, so check it out. My final one, and this one I, I again, am so excited to share with you guys is Fredericksburg, Texas. That's right. And you know, I live in Texas, so for me this is kind of a it's one of those ones that you don't think about that you should go check out, but it is a really cool area to go to. Anyone with German roots, you might want to check out Fredericksburg, okay? It's it's really neat. Um it will give you a small chill. It, it gets a small chill with winter, you know, you get a little bit of snow but not massive amounts. It averages about 13 inches of snow per year, and the U.S. average is roughly 28 inches. So you get a little bit of that Christmas feel without having to have massive amounts of snow on the ground. So if you're not a snow person, this could be a destination you might consider. Um, you know, if you've always wanted to visit Germany at Christmas and the, the Christmas markets in Germany, this gives you that feel because this is a little German town. It was settled by... by uh, German settlers, so it has that that German feel to it, which is really great. So luckily here in the U.S., we have this German town of Fredericksburg. Um, you know, they celebrate, you know, they have plenty of festivals going on, and you don't have to travel as far, get a flight overseas, so that's great. So on top of the German festivals, there's, you know, ice skating, shopping, and eating, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toot my own horn a little bit, guys. You know, Texas down here, we... We know how to cook. I'm going to tell you that right now. They they know how to cook. So the food is phenomenal. You can't even go wrong. I can't even make a personal recommendation because it's, it's all good. Again, I'm salivating. So uh, plus for many of you guys that don't know Fredericksburg, okay, it's kind of the official wine country out here of West Texas. I mean, they have some beautiful and gorgeous wines, plenty of vineyards out here. So if you're looking and that's your thing too, or you were considering Napa, hey man, make it a Christmas trip and throw in some wine country here in Texas. It kind of wraps up into a great holiday package for you. Or, you know, if you really want a truly different experience, um, go to the, if I'm going to get this, make sure I get this right, Sour Beckman Living History Farm. You can celebrate like the early settlers did. And see, like, the old-style decorations. So it's great. I mean, Christmas is magical to me. It really is. It's friends and family and all the craziness that reminds me that we're all alive. So getting the chance to get a lot of these wonderful cultural and fun experiences um, it just warms my heart, gets me excited. And it might open up new traditions for you or your family. So it's worth checking these out. So that's my number five, Fredericksburg, Texas. So just to recap, but number one, North Pole, Alaska. Two, Mackinac Island, Michigan. Three, Asheville, North Carolina. Four, Durango, Colorado. And number five, Fredericksburg, Texas. And yes, that, that's right. Those are my top five recommended U.S. Christmas destinations. So check those out. I hope you guys have been inspired to take some trips this year or look to start planning one. It's never too late to start traveling. You know, so if you've not been a traveler before and hearing all this has inspired you, man, that's just awesome. Um, it can open up your eyes to new experiences, even unlock things about yourself that you never knew. So I encourage you to check it out. Uh, I believe everyone should travel and explore more of what this world has to offer. It can give us an appreciation and love for so many things. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Travel Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review that really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you and have a good night.
You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From travel to health and wellness to entertainment and life and happiness to sex and relationships. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast. 